John, the letter of 1 John, uh, which is in the New Testament, is towards the end of the New Testament. It's one of the last books in the Bible, um, just before uh, 2 and 3 John, and the book of Revelation. So if you're turning backwards, you should be able to find it rather quickly. 1 John is where we're going to be looking today, specifically in verses 1 through 4. The... uh, the church was one that, uh, that we would call a, a hurting church. Uh, it had recently not only suffered a, a major split, but it was disunified. It was deeply divided. Uh, it was a church that had at one point been known as the healthiest congregation in the area. Uh, it had the most well-known pastors in and out of the, the pulpit quite quite frequently, and it was the envy of the surrounding area churches, both in its size as well as its health and the maturity of its believers. Thanks to its planter, the church also enjoyed a deep, rich theological understanding of, of the faith. But as the church grew older, it also grew colder and perhaps more lackadaisical, when, uh, whereas they had shown the highest fidelity to, to Christian orthodoxy, it was currently under theological attack. The very core of what they believed and were taught as Christians were not only questioned, but all, all outright contradicted. And this attack was not one from the outside culture, Rather, this was an attack that came from inside the church walls. For certain people had had snuck into church leadership that should not have been and were giving privileges of teaching, administration, and oversight into the life of the church and into the personal lives of those who were its members. These people used their position of influence to teach things about Christ that were different than they had heard previously. Some were easily persuaded. Others were not. Still, some hung on the fence. If one was not on board with this teaching or was on the fence about it, proponents of this view were quick to unsettle them with the idea that if you don't hold to what we're teaching, then you may not be a Christian at all. Whatever the reason these persuaders had for their uh, creating such a disturbance in the church, it was certainly not for love. For these persuaders were evidently ruthless in the way that they treated those who disagreed with them. And after somewhat of a tumultuous internal conflict, these teachers had left the church, presumably to start their own church or their organization, but the damage had already been done and it had lasting effects. These proponents of this teaching were still in the geographic community and were still rubbing shoulders with those who uh, continued to be in this original church. And the remnants of the people who were in this church were left disillusioned. They didn't know what to believe anymore. Many of them were unloving. The example that had been set by them, both in in the leadership of the people that had left and in other things, that it left them with an unbiblical practice of what it means to love other Christians. And many of them were, were confused of the many fallouts of this aberrant teaching was a lack of assurance the people that left the church, who stayed in the church, uh, were left with an insecurity about the state of their faith. Could they really be saved? And if so, could they lose it? The persistence and the presence and the power of those who left were still causing considerable uncertainty in the lives of those who stayed concerning who Christ was and their position as Christians. They were confused about whether or not they could still say they belonged to Christ. This church was a mess. And this church is what we know of as the first century church in Ephesus. 
in the let, uh, this letter is written by the Apostle John around the same time that he wrote his, his gospel and as well as the same time that he wrote the second and third letters. And it was not written too much sooner before he, he wrote the, 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 what we know of as the book of, of Revelation. John, you could consider him the former pastor of this church, but, but not really. It's not as if he, he resigned and went to a different job or took another church. John was most likely sitting in exile on an island called Patmos, per, uh, being persecuted for his faith. Um, this letter, then, is John's attempt to hold the ship together. This letter is wet with pastoral encouragements for a hurting church. This letter is chock full of pastoral wisdom and encouragement for a feeble church to strengthen their weakened knees and take hold of who they are in Christ and have full assurance of who he was and who they are in him. This letter is for the first century church at Ephesus, and it is also for the 21st century church in Mora. This letter, uh, we are going to be starting this morning a new series in the letter of 1 John titled, That We May Know. And, and every week we're going to unpack what it is that God has for us through the pen of John to know how to live out our lives individually as Christians and corporately as a church together. And this morning we're going to start off with the most basic, the most fundamental uh, elementary level of the Christian life, which is to to know and to live out the gospel. So if you have your Bibles with you, please follow along with me as I read 1 John, starting in chapter 1. This is what John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That which we have heard from the beginning, which we, what, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life that was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Father, would you take these words that are prepared by me and the words that you wrote through the Apostle John and apply it to our lives so that we can have, uh, so that we can have knowledge of what is this gospel, who is Jesus, and that we'd be able to live rightly for Him. And it's in His great name that I ask. Amen. Well, if we as individual Christians and we as a corporate body uh, of a church want to live an authentic and consistently biblical life, we must know and live out three things that John lays out for us. And the first thing is, is that we must understand the gospel. We must understand the gospel. We live in, in, in very what you would call confusing times. Up to a few years ago, we were living in a cultural moment that defined truth in terms of uh, individual subjectivism. In other words, just a few years ago, the way that truth was defined was really up to the, the individual. Whatever was true for you was, was, may not necessarily be true for me, and so there were very few objective realities that, uh, that the cultural elite said uh, existed. But in recent years, our culture has in, in many ways moved past that. And in place of, of that mindset is, is not this subjective truth where you can define it for yourself and I can define it for myself. Uh, rather, it is a subjective truth that says, I interpret reality and you need to agree with me. So gone are the days in this pseudo-tolerance that said, oh, you know, whatever floats your boat um, is fine. I might not agree with you. I might not agree with your practices. But, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, I'm completely uh, fine with it. And, and that's great. I'm not going to impose on your, your right to, to think differently than me. Rather, what we are seeing today is this idea of if you don't agree with me, then you're just intolerant. 
And if you're intolerant of what I believe, then that must mean that you hate me. And because uh, hate is, is, is wrong, um, therefore your understanding of reality is also wrong, and that's uh, not only just unkind, but it's also unhelpful for society. And do you see how that, that shift then from whatever floats your boat to, uh, to conform or else can easily change a culture quickly. It's very much a mafia mindset, whereas if I just lean on this guy a little bit, then he is going to follow into the same mindset that, uh, that we hold to. And obviously this has, uh, this has impacted the way that our culture views uh, gender and sexuality and other cultural forays, but it has also changed the way that our culture looks at Jesus as well. In almost any poll that you'll read today, it, it, it turns out that the culture at large is very positive towards Jesus. Indeed, if you ask the average person what they think about Jesus, a response that you're probably going to get is, I like Jesus. I think Jesus is a good guy. He was a good teacher. He was very loving and he was very accepting of all people. Now, as long as you stick to that kind of Jesus in our culture, you're going to be okay. But if you decide to stick to the, the Jesus that we find in the Bible, well then you're more than likely going to have some, some problems coming your way. And in much the same way, John is dealing with a first century version of that mindset. He looks at one, he looks at the argument, the one that says uh, in his day, you know, Jesus, he wasn't anything uh, like you've been taught. Jesus, he wasn't eternal. Uh, no one, no one is. And because he, he wasn't eternal, therefore he wasn't divine, meaning that he wasn't God. And and because he wasn't eternal and because he wasn't divine, then you can simply not have a relationship with God through him. There are other ways to do it. To think that, to think in that sort of way is not only backwards, but it's, it, it's also socially reprehensible. Now, now it's here that John speaks plainly to his people, and he speaks to the people in, in the pew who are, are tempted to downplay Jesus in any sort of way. He takes that argument to, that says those sorts of things, and he really throws it on its heels. He gives a completely different proof for the historical understanding of who Jesus is than anyone else in Ephesus could, and anyone else since the time of John has been able to do uh, he is going to lay out who Jesus was. And he essentially says, you know, it's, it's really not about who Jesus is to you. And, and it really has nothing to do with how you conceive Jesus to be. Really, it has everything to do with who Jesus truly was and is. And he's going to lay out who this Jesus was and what it means for a second. But notice first the authority by which John claims to uh, represent this Jesus Christ. Notice that the authority is not derived from some positional status. He doesn't come at us or his readers by saying, hey, Look, I am the pastor at Ephesus. I know what I'm talking about. You just need to listen to me and you need to follow along because I know what I'm talking about. He's not using a positional sort of authority here. Rather, what John is using here is John is using the authority of experience. He is using how he has seen Jesus. He, he's, he's essentially saying, look, I can tell you that these false teachers are wrong. And why they're wrong is because I spent time with the guy. I listened to him. I saw him. I, 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 I rubbed shoulders with him. I saw him perform miracles. He wasn't some spiritual apparition. I touched him with my own hands. So the authority that he stakes himself in is one of experience. And is that experience then that he helps ground the most basic tenet of Christianity, the person and work of Jesus Christ. In verse 1, John lays out for us the et eternality of Jesus. Notice what he says. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, this is not the first time that John has talked like this. He wrote something very similar in his gospel in the prologue to it, which says, in the beginning was the word. Word. 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In both instances, he, now he refers to Jesus really in two ways. The first is he, he addresses him as the eternal pre-existent one. And the other, he addresses Jesus as the incarnate one. Let's break that down a little bit. He first says that Jesus was the pre-existent one. When it says that which was from the beginning, or he says in the gospel, uh, in the beginning was the word, he is referring to the fact that there is, there's never been a time that Jesus has not existed. He was never created. He has always been and always will. Logically speaking then, John is correct when he refers to Jesus as, as the Word who was with God and also was God. It's an allusion to the, the triune nature of God from eternity past. And in our, in our Bibles, in Genesis chapter 1, Moses wrote, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what was the means by which God created all those things? It was by speaking. Speaking what? Words. And now John is saying that this word of God, who all things were created through, was this Jesus. So it would make sense then in Colossians chapter 116 when Paul would say, by him, meaning by Christ, all things were created both in heaven and on earth. So we see John referring to Jesus as the eternal one, the one who has always existed and will have no end. But John doesn't Leave it there. Notice also that John says that Jesus was manifested to us. To be manifested means to be revealed. It means to be presented. It means to be shown in time, space, and, and matter. In this, John is referring to Jesus' incarnation. And what we mean by the incarnation is how the eternal God took on flesh and became a person born of the Virgin Mary. No, why would he need to why would Jesus need to do this? Look again at John's prologue to his gospel. It says in John chapter 1, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. That's awfully strange. Obviously, something had gone terribly wrong so that uh, when Jesus, who created the world, would come down to the world and no one would even know or really care about why he was there. But ironically, that is the exact reason why he came. Almost immediately after the world was created, the first humans, Adam and Eve, uh, made the choice to disregard God and go, by acting against his will and his commands, by taking of the fruit that they should not have. And the result of them uh, disobeying God's commands was threefold. The first was that it would end up in eventual physical death. Whereas Adam and Eve were never meant to die, they would experience pain, suffering, and physical death. The second would be that all of their descendants, which meaning everyone in the world who has ever been born, save Jesus Christ, would inherit a nature that disregards God and lacks the ability to desire him. And the third consequence was spiritual separation, which means that true fellowship with uh, humans and God would be cut off. And you don't have to read history very far to see how all this plays out. Really, all we need to do is look back on our lives. And we can see how this sin, how this disregard for, for God has wreaked havoc in our lives, in our, in our human history. And because we lack the ability to be inclined to God, God had to be the initiator of reconciling that relationship. And so Jesus then became incarnate. He became a, a person. And because uh, he does not have a sinful nature, 
because he could do no wrong, indeed he, he, he could not sin, he was able to live an absolutely perfect life. Though he was morally perfect, he wasn't welcomed. He wasn't well-liked. He was betrayed. He was arrested. He was convicted as an innocent man. He was executed in a manner that is perhaps the worst form of execution that humanity has ever devised, a crucifixion. But his death, because he was a perfect uh, perfect here on earth, God the Father was pleased to accept his death on behalf of us. That he was able to take the place for the punishment for our sins. He took upon himself on the cross the punishment for our disregard, our disregard, our sin was given to Christ and his perfection, his righteousness was given to us. Though we are not perfect, we are attributed as being so in God's eyes because of Christ. Our sins were paid for by someone else, the incarnate God himself, Jesus Christ. Three days later, he was raised from the dead to prove his power over that sin and create a totally new life, a totally new start for us, for those who trust him by faith. If you have not trusted in Jesus yet to take that penalty for your, your sin and give you a fresh start, do it today. Give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Do not, uh, do not desire to take that punishment upon yourself. Jesus took it for you and it can be removed by faith. It's not about what you've done. You can't do enough to be right with God. Only Jesus Christ could. Come to him today. So what is the gospel then? The gospel literally means good news. So when we talk about understanding and living out the gospel, we're talking about understanding and living out the good news news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We live in confusing times, but let us not be confused about the gospel and who Jesus was and what he's done for us revealed in God's word. So, we need to understand the gospel, but secondly, we also need to experience the fellowship that comes with the gospel. Experience the fellowship of the gospel. You know, when I was, in a, when I was uh, a child, in my primary education, the, the school that I went to was also part of the church that my family attended. And uh, though the gym was originally our cafeteria, there was this magical room across the hall from the gym where really cool stuff always happened. It was called the fellowship hall. And when we entered in that fellowship hall, I knew something great was going to happen. Whether it was a birthday party, whether it was a um, anniversary party or entertainment or classroom plays and productions, family events. Uh, my, my Cub Scout troop even, even met there. A lot of cool stuff happened in the fellowship hall. Uh, so naturally growing up and even Today, my view of what fellowship means is a bit jaded because of what that fellowship hall meant to me at that, that time. But biblically speaking, the idea of fellowship has very little to do with social events. It has more to do with our connection and union both with Christ and our connection and union together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, the Greek word for, for fellowship Fellowship is koinonia. You don't need to know that. It's not going to be on the test at the end of the sermon. But you do need to know how other ways it can be translated. And, and another way to think of fellowship could be translated with the word partnership. Another word that could be used is joint ownership or mutual sharing. And so when we think in, in, of fellowship in those sorts of ter uh, terms, it, it sheds much more light on what John is trying to communicate with us here. Look with me again in verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. 
so that you may have partnership with us. And indeed, our partnership is with God the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it's easy in our um, hypersensitive, easily offended culture to look at this verse and say, what an, what an arrogant statement this is. Who does John think he is? In order to have fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ, we actually need to have fellowship with, with John. We need to be right with John in order to make this, this happen. But that would be completely misunderstanding John's point of view here. Instead, he is cre- he, instead of creating a wedge, John is trying to help us. Remember, he is writing as an apostle. And as an apostle, that's a capital A. That's not a small A. And an apostle was someone who not only encountered Jesus, but an apostle was someone who was in Jesus' inner circle. He knew Jesus very, very well. Uh, He would be able then to accurately say, folks, there's a lot of fake news about Jesus going on out there. CNN is running wrong reels about who Jesus is. And John could, could weed that out and say, what I'm saying is about Jesus is accurate. So he is entreating us to have fellowship, to have joint ownership, to have partnership with him because he knows the right way to Jesus. He knows how we can get to him. Therefore, in verse 3, when he says, that which we have seen and that which we have heard, we proclaim also to you, he is giving us a declaration about Jesus Christ and he is inviting us into a relationship with this Jesus. It restores the gulf that was made between us and God because of Adam and Eve until our conversion. Because of this, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, I used to love the, the fellowship hall at the church that, that we went to um, because I knew something, was always, uh, something good was always going to come. And it usually delivered, but it was short-lived. And John here invites us into something that is much deeper. It is much more longer lasting. And it's much more satisfying. He offers us partnership with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One that is free from guilt. Free from shame and despair. So we need to trust in Christ or renew that trust today and experience the fellowship of the gospel. Third and finally, we need to receive the joy of the gospel. Excuse me. John states in verse 4 that one of his purposes in writing this letter was so that our joy may be complete. You know, back in in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, there were several hundred studies about happiness that was published every year. By 2014, there were well over 10,000 per year studies of happiness. It was an exciting shift for, for psychology, one that the public would immediately respond to. Major media outlets uh, clamored to cover the new research soon. Entrepreneurs wanted to capitalize on it. They found startups and, 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 and phone apps that were geared to ways that they can make you happy. It was uh, followed by, a, del- uh, by a, a, a large amount of, of celebrities and coaches and, and, and motivational speakers all eager to share the gospel of happiness. According to psycho- Psychology Today, in 2000, the number of books about happiness was a modest 50. Eight years later, in 2008, that number had skyrocketed to 4,000 books on happiness. Of course, people have always been interested in happiness, but all that attention um, has made an impact. Since the mid-2000s, the interest in happiness as measured by Google searches has tripled. The shortcut 
to anything you want in your life, writes author uh, Rhonda uh, Byrne in her best-selling book, The Secret, is to be and feel happy now. And yet, there's a major problem with this happiness frenzy, isn't there? It has failed to deliver on its promise. Though the happiness industry continues to grow more and more every year, as a society, we're more miserable than ever. Social scientists have uncovered a sad irony. Chasing happiness actually makes you unhappy. And perhaps the reason that we have such a happiness problem in our culture is that we confuse happiness with joy. And they're not the same thing. To be happy is to find pleasure in a circumstance. But the minute that that circumstance changes, the happiness flees away. But if you can find joy... You can find contentment in any situation. And that is what John is writing for. You know, just up until I I began studying this book, just within this week, um, I I was a little put off by this verse in verse 4. And it landed on the word, our. Because in verses 1 through 3, John continues to use the first person plural word, we. And whenever he says we here, He is referring to the apostles, a group that is not who he is writing to. And so uh, when I came to verse 4 and he says that he's writing to make our joy, it seems as if he is only writing for himself. I'm writing this so yes, so you can learn about Jesus, but I'm really writing this so that I can get joy in helping you along here. And if you connect the fact with, the, with this book that if you read it in the right fashion can really have this us versus them mentality. It's not what John's trying to do, but you can, you can certainly read into that uh, sort of polarity. You can get this out of that, but that's not what John is intending here. Um, what he's intending here is even though he uses first person plural to refer to the apostles in verses 1 through 3, he makes a shift in verse 4. And when he uses the word our, he is making a shift into more inclusive language. He is no longer saying us. He is saying our joy. Our collective joy together. John is giving us the filet mignon of faith in this letter. He's not only telling us about who Jesus is, but he's uniquely telling us about who we are and how to practically live out the life of faith. And he knows that if we can put into practice the things that he is writing in this letter, our lives can be less chaotic. Our lives can be less stressful. Our lives can be less depressing. Our lives can be less anxious because he knows that David was referring to Jesus in Psalm 16, verse 11, when he says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so like a skilled pastor now, John Um, knows how to deliver it. He knows how to deliver that joy through knowing the gospel, through experiencing the fellowship of God with the gospel, and to receive the joy that accompanies it. You know, the church that John wrote to was a hurting, messy church. But he also knew that the power of the gospel was sufficient to restore what was lost. And by understanding Jesus rightly, 
what he has done for us, responding in faith and experiencing true fellowship with God and receiving and basking in that joy that comes from the gospel that can be had today will amplify in the coming age. So friends, let us know the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, there's so much that... uh, There's so little about the gospel, that God is holy, that we are sinful, that Christ bridged that gap for us, and by faith we can be renewed with you. But Lord, there are so many implications from that gospel. Lord, help us to experience fellowship. Help us to experience joy that is so difficult in a joyless world. Help us run to Christ. Lord, for those who have never known the gospel or received the good news about Jesus, would you save them today? Would they come to glorify you by saying, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Do that work in our hearts. Revive those who have strayed from you. And may we all cherish the great gospel of our faith. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. John, the letter First John, uh, which is in the New Testament, is towards the end of the New Testament. It's one of the last books in the Bible, um, just before uh, Second and Third John, and the book of Revelation. So if you're turning backwards, you should be able to find it rather quickly. First John is where we're going to be looking today, specifically in verses 1 through 4.